We are ready to resume the second part of the morning session. Back to the front. And before I introduce the next speakers, we'd like to welcome Sam Whitmer from Routledge. They have a special stand for us. Uh, with Olympic related stuff, so don't hesitate to take your plastic cards out if you fancy a particular uh, book. I'm sure Sam will be very happy to uh, uh, take your money and of course uh, <laughs> advise you on, uh, on any uh, future publications. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce the next uh, speakers. Uh, it's in plural because we have two fantastic uh, ladies, if I may, from the IOC Sports Department with phenomenal biographies and they're hugely qualified to tell us uh, everything about uh, IOC and the Nas and National Sport Federations. Uh, Irina Burjak is uh, the first speaker. She's been working for the IOC for the past, uh, sport department for the past nine years and she attended four editions of the games. She knows the games inside out. She knows what the games are all about and how individuals engage with them. And the second speaker is Irina Blatke. Uh, who, is, uh, who has also um, a phenomenal biography, professional biography. She only joined ISC, I believe, recently, last year, a couple of years ago. But before that, she was the head of sports of the Sochi Organizing Committee. So she even knows you know, much better how to deal with the sports federations and the patients uh, that may uh, arise as a result of this. Without further ado, the floor is yours. Good morning. Um... So for this morning, um, the objectives we have with ARENA uh, are twofold. One, I'll be presenting on the main, the main framework that applies to the involvement of international and national federations for the organization of the Games. And then I'll pass it on to ARENA, who will give you a number of very tangible and factual examples from the Sochi Games and how the national federations were involved. So before we speak about national federations, we thought it would be interesting to just quickly go over how we see the role of international federations within the, the Olympic Games delivery model. And the idea here too is um, we actually just presented the same presentation last week in Tokyo to the, um, to the Tokyo Organizing Committee during a sport workshop. So again, had the same type of discussion, which was, was quite interesting with, uh, with the Japanese national federations. So if we look at the role and responsibilities of the international federations, um, I, I won't read it out, but it was just to give you the, the, um, the reference from the Olympic Charter where we detail the role of the international federations in the organization of the Games. Um, there's much more to it than, um, than this paragraph from Olympic Charter 46, but gives you a, a bit of the context. So, Looking at the, the charter definition, um, what we do see is that the international federations determine the rules, the regulations, and the requirements for the respective sports. But also, kind of behind all of that, and more importantly, they also bring a huge amount of expertise and experience to the table, and also can pro um, provide feedback on many different areas outside of the field of play. So definitely a key partner for um, the organizing committees in the various stages of planning. Also, um, and, and one message uh, that we need to or tend to pass as well is um, the fact that the IFs are really the final authority when it comes to their sport um, and are the, um, the, main, um, the main body communicating with the organizing committee. So all of the formal communication goes between the organizing committee and the international federations. But as you'll see, the national federations are really a key part of all the different stages of planning. So if we look at the roles and responsibilities of the national federations within the games model, um, even before the, the games are held, the national federations bring a huge amount of experience to the table when it comes to the preparation of the bids. Um, what then looking at games time, um, the idea is that there is that contact with the national federation and that is done through the sport manager um, within the organizing committee sport department. Um, one key uh, opportunity that, that the organizing committees have is to integrate the national federations and the international federations during site visits. So the international federations will come to the host city multiple times in the seven years leading up to the games to meet on a number of operational topics. 
And what we always advise is that they also invite the national federations of that sport who can participate in discussion, understand what the role is and how they can contribute to, uh, to this great project. Um, then, if we look at the, the key roles and really how we see the, the, the involvement of the national federations, I guess that the first key role they have is in the preparation of the national team. Um, so again, if we look at London, the, the passion and the engagement of the crowd with, um, with the host nation athletes is really key and the better the results um, that we have from the national team athletes, the better the engagement can be. Um, so this is really one key area that we encourage the national federations to take very much seriously, working with their athletes, working on ensuring they have the best possible preparation for the games. Then if we look at where national federations can bring um, additional value and where they are integrated into the discussions when it comes to, to planning, um, there's a number of, of key areas which I'll go through into, into detail. I'm already here giving you examples when it comes to sport managers, to national technical officials, sport volunteers, um, equipment, um, as well as hosting, um, hosting test events. So if we go more into detail on the different points, so when it comes to the sport manager, who's really the main person within the sport team following preparations for that sport, the national federations are a key source of expertise, so they can um, recommend um, key persons to take those roles so that the international, the, the international federation can rely on the recommendations made by the national federations uh, in terms of persons that should be considered for that role. Um, as well, there are also opportunities for secondments where some national federations will actually provide secondies into the organizing committee to work um, on the planning of that sport and in the end um, the International Federation always has a final authority to approve the selected candidate. If we then look at national technical officials and sport volunteers, um, here it's really a key area for where national federations have a lot of value to bring. Um, if we look at the numbers, you have between 7,000 and 12,000 um, work for, for summer games and four to 5,000 for the winter games. And these are people that have to be recruited by the organizing committee um, in advance of the games. Where then the national federations can assist is that they know these pools of people. There might be um, great pools of volunteers, of national technical officials that already um, work in their own competition. So the national federations will be key to, to provide that information to the table. Um, the sport managers then can also work with the national federations to develop recruitment strategies, to develop um, identification strategies, also looking at what is best for the host country moving forward. Do we need uh, more volunteers within a specific region or do we need some uh, country-wide depending on the size of the country? These are really strategies that can be discussed with the national federation. Looking at identification of such persons, again, it can take a lot of time. Um, what could happen is that there actually there isn't the depth um, of resources in the host country and that a sport may not be as developed as, as others and we may, need to, to rec we may need to train people to take these positions. So this is again where the National Federation can help identify if we can already find a sufficient pool of people to fill these positions or whether there has to be a focus on um, training and um, ensuring that, that new, kind of new uh, positions can be filled. Um, if we look at the, maybe the, the link between the national technical officials and the sport specific volunteers, one of the strategies that's being applied in Rio is that the candidates that are not selected for national technical officials, they can, they're, I'd say, first in line when it comes to looking at sport specific volunteers. Um, then, if we look at the legacy, well this leaves a huge legacy for the host country in terms of um, benefiting future generations of athletes, in terms of having that experience to organize more events. So again, the legacy of having trained these people, identified these people, perhaps doubling or tripling the number of national technical officials that a country has, has a huge legacy for the, um, for the host country. And again, where the organizing committee can actually help the national federation, is um, ensuring that they actually have the information regarding the different um, volunteers that work during the game so that the National um, Federation has 
information on who, who they can use or who they can work with for future sports events. Um, if we look at test events, uh, test events being a key part of, uh, of planning for the Games, again the national federations can have a key role to play in terms of assisting the, the organizing committee to deliver these events. Um, there are three main elements that are normally tested at every test event, which are field of play, technology and workforce. Then in terms of the, um, the test event strategy, a number of other functional areas are also tested across the different events, but that's something that has to be decided by the organizing committee in terms of where they put resources and what types of events they want to host. But here the National Federation can assist in that maybe there are events that they're already organizing within a given sport that could be used for a test event, um, or they could be bidding for um, future events which again could be used within the host country um, as test events for the games. And finally, last point before I, I pass it on to Irina is on sports equipment, um, where again the legacy from the sport equipment that is um, purchased by the organizing committee can greatly benefit the athlete, athletes within a given sport. Again, here what the national federations can do is help the organizing committee to understand what are the, the legacy needs for sport equipment. Is there a great need for a certain type of equipment for given sports or Maybe there isn't, and it's better to, to rent. So again, an organizing committee will have to look at either buying equipment or renting equipment, and the National Federation can be a key partner in identifying what needs to be done and what can be done with it afterwards uh, in terms of looking at do we give the sports equipment to local clubs, does it go to, the, to elite athletes, and really strategies can be <laughs> defined in terms of looking at what do we do with all the sport equipment after the game. So if I pass it on to Rina, um, she'll be able to present a number of, um, of interesting, um, yeah, of a number of uh, applications of different, uh, different points within such a game. Thank you, Isabella. You just heard the ISU or ISC institutional approach to on the roles and responsibilities of national and international federations and now it's time to see how it was implemented in life. So using the Sochi 2014 show, <laughs> showcase. So I will cover the following uh, topics uh, and the core of my presentation will be based on my personal observations and on my numerous discussions with national federations and athletes. As was just mentioned, I was a sports director of Sochi Games and I was engaged in the Sochi 2014 project since the first days of the beat, uh, early 2006, and I finished with the last day of the Paralympic Games, so I had my experience dealing with national federations through the eight years, and it, I would like to say it was painful, sometimes it was with blood, but at the end we are quite good friends now. <laughs> no. I will, I will also touch uh, on the involvement of international and national federations with Sochi 2014 organizing committee. I will explain how Olympic Games impacted the development of the uh, sport in Russia with a focus on national federation structure, communication approach and funding. I will also think, I, I also think it will be interesting for you to understand and to hear about post-games uh, informal evaluation completed by national federations and I made few recommendations of, on the relationship between national federations and OCOG, for if anybody is interested. And again, as I said, all my, observation, all my observations are based on the relationship with national federations that I built and from 2006. And just to be clear, right now I will be representing Sochi 2014 sport, so I will have to take my IRC hat off and I will put my IOCOC hat on. So it's a, may, my, my position might not be always politically correct, but this is what, what happened in the game. So I have to, so I have to put my thoughts on papers before I get as I have too much to say. So as always. <laughs> so uh, just Isabella just explained what is expected by the International Olympic Committee from the International Federation in regards to the games preparation. As you know that each international federation determines the technical requirements of its sport and it's very important for the sport department of the organizing committee to make sure that OCOC executives 
have a good understanding of how international federations work, why they demand so much, and how to work with them together. So each international federation is very much unique. On the capacity, some federations are much, uh, give uh, greater authorities to their professional staff. Some federations do not have professional staff and they have to engage other professionals somehow. So, but it's, um, uh, having said that, uh, this for the Sochi 2014, uh, we had to liaise and work together with international federations on the number of the topics which are listed here. So these are the key, key uh, matters we, we were liaising with international federations, asking for the formal or informal approval, asking the advice or any comments. And I believe this is the way it should be. This is where international federations have expertise and experience as they are running numerous events throughout the years and they have experience in running many of Olympic Games. So they can provide you very great input and expertise for your for the sport department planning. And um, now going back to the National Federation. And as Isabella said, National Federations play a very, very important role in the games preparation. So as we all know that the key and the most important goal of each National Federation is the preparation of athletes. But needless to say that experience and expertise available in the host country national federations should be utilized by the organizing committee as much as possible. In Sochi, uh, we engaged national federations at a very early, early stage, starting from the venue design and development, because we needed the expertise to, provide, uh, to be provided to the developers and to the venue owners. I don't know how much you know about Sochi, but we had to build all the venues from scratch. We had nothing before the game, so the expertise provided by National Federation was very important. Um, and uh, for many sports, the venue design expertise did not exist in Russia, so we had to rely heavily on the International Federation expertise and on the international experts. And as per Sochi 2014 venue use agreement, we had the venue owners responsible for the procurement of the sport equipment for the venue. So again, national federations were consultant by the venue owners together with international federations on the identification of the equipment and on the procurement of the equipment. So for some of the test events, national federations even provided some sport equipment as we were late in procuring it. So it was, they saved us in some cases. So with, um, with the equipment bought by the venue owner and remained at the venue, now national federations are being able to use it for the post-games activities at the venues. There was actually quite a great example from Vancouver Games when um, uh, the equipment, all sport equipment was donated to the national federations post-games. Um, for example, like national federations even took the responsibility for, for the sport equipment during the games. They even appointed a person who will look after this equipment during the games. So that to make sure that nothing gets lost or damaged <laughs> during the games. So the greatest role also national federation in our case played uh, in the recruitment and training of sport workforce, including, uh, including OCOC staff and including NTOs and sport volunteers. I know Isabel already mentioned NTO and the sport volunteers training by National Federation, but um, we should not forget about OCOC. We knew nothing, I mean, apart from sport department, but the rest of OCOC knew nothing about how to deliver sport events. And most of the people saw the sport event on TV. So, uh, and for us to learn about sport event, what it looks like, and we went to the National Federations asking them if they allow Sochi 2014 staff just to work as volunteers at their events. Because we do run multiple international events and national events in the country, so the, the first year we were working as volunteers at, at uh, National Federations event. <laughs> the next year we went to National Federations and we asked if we could be more than volunteers. 
can we pro do some operational roles? Like media curation manager could be working in mid zone or media uh, media center of the venue, or transport manager would like to work as, together with transport people of national federation to just to see what the requirements of different clients uh, of the event and. Maybe on the third year, we were able to deliver the event together with, with national federations. Um, the good showcase was 2011 uh, World Championship in figure skating in Moscow, as the event was allocated originally to Japan, but due to the natural disaster, Japan had to sort of uh, pass the event to, to another country because they were not able to deliver it. So the event was given to Russia one month before the event. So in 95% uh, the event was delivered by Sochi 2014 staff. Uh, I'm not saying National Federation was happy about it because we actually forced ourselves into them, right? They were, it was a very high risk for them because uh, National Figure Skating Federation is quite strong. They run events all the time in the country and all suddenly hundreds of amateurs are coming and asking if they allow us to run the event together. So it was a risk for them, but they trusted us, and I believe the event was the World Championship was quite good, um, delivered quite well. So uh, National Federation can also assist in the recruitment of uh, critical or COC staff, including uh, sport managers. So the, the National Federations were the first uh, place where we went to, asking to help us to identify to find the sport managers for each sport. So Sochi 2014 also together with the National Federations developed a very ex in extensive program of anti work training. We allocated quite a bit of budget for the training which included um, atten uh, attending international events, uh, running workshops and uh, uh, training NTOs at IF events in our country, uh, testing NTOs at the test events and, right, uh, and uh, running the games together. So for some sport discipline, we had to develop NTOs from scratch as we didn't have anybody in the country. So this process also included um, uh, theory training, examination, and licensing of the people. That was, uh, we, we, I don't think we could do that without uh, national federations. So keeping in mind that main, uh, NTOs in Russia paid, not, sport, not volunteers, they get per diem. So for the games time, we had to uh, do individual contracts with every single person. And again, National Federation was able to help us. I mean, uh, the scope of winter games is smaller than summer. We had over 1,600 people and two or so, but for the sport department, it was quite a burden to process so many contracts in addition to what we had to deliver. So we also, similar pr process was um, regarding sport specific volunteers that included recruitment, selection, training national or sport volunteers at uh, National Federations event. We had sport specific training at the venues, which we had to again work together with National Federation and testing sport volunteers at the test events. So, and of course we also asked National Federations to help us with the provision of forerunners. Uh, because it was required number of them for many of sports in the winter games. So basically, but uh, at the official Sochi 2014 test events was the first relationship uh, between OCOC and NF so were tested. So in most cases, the national federations wanted to run the test events with own staff without uh, involvement of Sochi 2014 staff helping, which totally defeated the purpose of the test event in the first place. So, um, as you know, the national federations used to have an ultimate control uh, over their events in the country, when in their country. So, and now OCOC comes and asks to take and uh, take the responsibility for, to run the events. So, this actually really strained the relationship, and as I said, that's why the blood came this time, but uh, we had our serious challenges regarding roles and responsibilities and in particular with financing and marketing. Uh, I don't think it's unique for Russia, it happens in every country. Um, and I know it was the case at the previous Winter Games. 
but National Federation can also provide us, uh, provided us with great help in uh, testing the games time processes and procedures. Uh, I don't know, the organizing committee, as an organizing committee, we had to produce lots of policies, procedures, and some of them, y you don't even know what you need to do before you test it. So we had to ask National Federations to help us, for example, how to um, we failed very badly at the test event, the uh, Biathlon Test Event, World Cup. We had, so we, with delivery of uh, rifles, we lost a couple of rifles, we, we lost ammunition, we had, and a few minutes later, after the athletes arrived to the airport, it was already in, 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 um, in the social media, the athletes were immediately sharing the bad experience with yeah. the world. So we had to come up with a solution so nothing similar happens at the games. So we developed different processes and policies and we needed to test them. So the National uh, Russian Biathlon Union was very nice to us by giving us athletes with rifles so we could test the process at the airport. So that was very good. We didn't lose any rifles at the games. So, so and then another important thing that each host country uh, wants to maximize their home field advantage as much as possible, which is natural for the host country. So in Russia, at some cases, it went out of control. So it was a lot of negative feedback from the national teams and national Olympic committees, which put us in a very uh, bad position that we had no authorities to fix it. So the future organizing committee should be aware of this challenge and work closely with national federations to ensure that fair play is respected and in regard and in regards to the home field advantage ambitions also national federations should also get some support so as i said there's nothing we can do it happens but the early we know and we need to find the right balance so at the early stage of our clock life National Federation can also provide a great support and assistance in the relationship with international federations, especially if there is a political conflict or between the OCOC and international federations. This being said, that it could also work the other way for you. Uh, if national federation is not very well supported in the international federation, this can also lead in the challenges in the relationship between IF and OCOG. So, and um, in some cases, national federations were not supportive of the OCOG, started dealing directly with international federations, as it was, how they said, it was compromising their relationship with international federations. But this is the case. OCOG has to communicate directly with IF on the games preparation matters. And uh, each international federation and national federation is unique. And the task of the OCOG is to figure out how to manage this on a case-by-case basis. The post-games legacy is a very huge, could be very huge or could be not existing at all in the, but it depends how proactive national federation is. The most tangible benefit each NF gets is uh, the venues course and the sport equipment and the trained people, the human legacy and also potential interest of the young kids into their sport. So the national federations need to take advantage out of it. So if national federation doesn't have a legacy plan, it's very difficult for the organizing committee to force it into them. So the legacy plan should also come from the national federation and the court should support the legacy plan. Okay, now I would like to touch on the game's impact on the sport development. First, let's start with a positive impact. Right, so again, I would like to note that I can only talk about winter federations, Russian winter federation that have events in the Olympic Games. So, as it was the case in many other countries, that there is always a lot of public interest in the traditional sports developed in the host countries. For Russia, we had strong interest in few winter sports like ice hockey, figure skating, biathlon, with a very limited interest in other Olympic winter sports. 
the pre-games public interest uh, in all Olympic sport largely was from promotion and communication activities of the marketing partners who made big, uh, made lots of efforts to be associated with the Olympic Games. So as for the post-game situation, there was an increase of interest driven by the successful performance of the national team and in particular by the in, um, success of individual athletes. Uh, the, interest was stimula uh, the interest stimulated the huge interest in the winter sports among kids, but it was driven by the role model athletes. Um, needless to say that uh, winter field of play and winter, uh, winter venue is more challenging and complicated than the summer games, and in most cases uh, sports are seasonal, or season, and the field of play depends on the climate zone and on the climate of this, you've seen the map of Russia and climate could be quite different so it's quite challenging to support and maintain the interest in the sport in some areas where it's not traditionally developed. So uh, that's why the grassroots development was, all, 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 was limited and stayed within the regions where it was originally developed. So the inspirational effect led to the creation of a few regional federations. Let's say figure skating was very popular, but the success of the national team led to the creation of two regional federations. And um, uh, there was quite a bit of a boom in the host city and in the host region where the venues are right now, and that's where the, the interest stays for now. Uh, as um, you know that the purpose-built venue in Sochi, of course, are being used right now by the train, uh, used for training camps by the national teams, and not only you know, the host region, by uh, other region national teams. Uh, Sochi originally was a place of uh, basically all year-round training camp, but it's general training, but now the athletes will be able to combine the uh, general sport training with sport specific training, which is uh, quite a good benefit for the National Federation. Um, the Olympic venues benchmark and interest in Olympic sport also led to the construction and uh, refurbishing of existing venues in other regions. But again, I'm talking about indoor sports. Outdoor sports, it's only limited to where it's being developed. So, also, a number of national events, including junior uh, level events, in, uh, increased in the sport, uh, national sport calendar. So, with the increase of, uh, to meet uh, the increase in participation, the number of international events run by the national federations also, due to ex having existing venues, also increased. And um, I would say the last season was quite successful regarding use of uh, all sport venues. In Sochi, we had a number of World Cups and uh, European Championship and World Championship. And I would say all Olympic venues except uh, Alpine freestyle snowboard, except the venues which require snow. I don't know, I'm not going to probably open a, a secret or something, but we had to produce snow. We had to store snow for the Olympic Games, right? So that's why we had snow. I'm not sure if it was the real snow during the game. So, but if there will be snow, I'm sure there will be some events at uh, outdoor venues in Sochi. So now there is also some negative uh, impacts that the uh, games had on the National Federation. So in particular, the increased post-games interest to specific sports and disciplines caught some National Federations off guard. The national federations didn't have the programs in place to meet the demands and ended up losing this interest. So that was especially true with regional clubs and regional schools who were not prepared for the growth. Um, there was some limited development in non-traditional sports for some regions, like Sochi, and uh, but. Um, not only Sochi, limited to Sochi, but Sochi was one of them. So national federations and regional federations were not interested in promoting these disciplines as there was no venues or no expertise available in the regions to continue to lead the development. 
And another negative impact was the marketing partners lost their interest to the individual athletes or sports uh, after the games. And finally, um, there was very limited or no interest in developing uh, sports where Russian athletes didn't medal. No medals, no interest. That's very sad, but this is the problem. So, now we are going uh, we are to organizational and operational structure of the national federations. So, as been said before, the organizational structure of each national federation is uh, different. Uh, depending on the existing expertise of the national of the specific national federation, there are very experienced national uh, federations with many years of experience running international events, national events at the highest level, and there are national federations with limited or no experience running international events. So, needless to say, that Olympic Games required additional obligations and responsibility of national federation. Uh, from the national federations, and some small federations were not resourced for them. So the extra work we created for them uh, had to <laughs> require additional redistribution of responsibilities within the federations, or required hiring additional staff members to look after the games time projects. The federal government provided uh, some extra funding for that to ensure the success of the teams and support Sochi 2014 uh, project, but it did not always increase enough capacity to deliver. Some national federations chosen the way of engaging business, business leadership in the leadership of national federation. That was a great help as in regards to the financial contribution to into the national federations. Many of the national federations presidents were extremely powerful business. Um, uh, business leaders who financially supported federations and uh, were able also to attract good sponsors using their connections and, and to fulfill the main objectives of the training of the national team some national federations of course hired additional coaches additional technicians or specialists international or national uh, some national federations restructured completely in order to meet the demands of uh, the games and ended up of hiring additional staff members like team managers or PR um, managers or communication specialists. Uh, the positive outcome was the return of the world-class coaches or specialists in, back into the country, as the ones that were working outside of the country. So in the, it, it was the case in some key sports. Um, there was um, uh, due to the increase in, fund, in fundings for the sports, where they could now offer substantial packages to to attract them back. So, in Sochi 2014, sport department hired a number of leaders from international from national federations, including four national federations presidents who became sport managers. I would like to say that normally the vice presidents. Um, volunteer position, they do not really get paid there, so so they could combine easily the role of sport manager in Sochi 2014 and being vice president of the National Federation, but it really helped us to communicate to each other. <coughs> uh, even though some sport managers, VPs, thought they would never be able to go back to National Federations because they made enemies in there, so that's the case. So, and um, for some of the smaller national federations, they had to hire international sport event consultants to provide national, uh, necessary assistance in organizing international events in the country for the first time. But this, we had the case in ski jumping in the North Combine. They never ran World Cups before, so they had to bring somebody in to, to assist them. So, uh, despite all these facts, all in all, it was a very limited changes in the overall governance structure of the national federations of Russia. So, and now, um, yes, now in Russia, the national federation development strategy was actually driven by long-term sport development plan, uh, which was a program uh, of sport development of the uh, for the Olympic cycle, and it, this plan continued; nothing changed. Some national federation strategy uh, was impacted by the additional new by the addition of new events into the sport program. 
the, the, in our case, we had 12 new events added, and some events were absolutely not developed or underdeveloped in the country, so the national federations had to budget and plan and, um, for the development of these sports. Um, national Federation received purpose-built sport venues that are under the financial responsibility now of the Ministry of Sport. So it means National Federations have now venues for, for their training. And um, there was uh, actually a uh, very obvious growth in professionalism of national coaches by, uh, from, from working in the mix with international coaches. Um, as been said already, National Federation received a number of uh, qualified national and international technical officials. So in some cases, they got new technical delegates and all now with Olympic experience. Um, the negative effect was, um, which is typical for every host country, that the funding gets cut after the games. So this reduced a number of training camps and number of athlete services and international coaches were out again. The best of that sub, uh, supported national teams. Now I would like to briefly highlight the communication strategy of national federations for pre-games uh, pre and post-games. In, in most cases, uh, the communication strategy was depending on the experience of national federations and capacity of national federations. Uh, closer to the games, communication activities were uh, increased due to the strong in, uh, interest of the Russian media uh, to the Olympic sport and part uh, participating athletes. So this um, media interest made some national uh, federations to hire additional staff to handle all the media requests. Some uh, national federations uh, man maintained the media interest by inviting media to their camps, to training camps, or allowing athletes to participate in their TV shows, but not all of them. Uh, some TV channels also initiated uh, TV, uh, some projects including introducing Olympic athletes and Olympic sports. Um, but post-games uh, communication was driven by the media interest to the medalist immediately after the games. And now it's very much limited and uh, only in the specialized media resources. Um, it's a common practice, uh, I will try to finish on time. It's a common practice that in the host, con the host country dedicates the great resources for the preparation of national teams. This is a list of um, um, uh, uh, activities that uh, the finance, uh, the findings was used. Additional resource also resources were allocated for the joint activities with Sochi 2014 and National Federation. And again, needless to say that it's a common practice that the finding level reduces post games, including a loss of interest from the marketing partners side. And. Um, Traditionally, uh, following each games, there is an adept uh, assessment on how athletes perform, which was managed by the Ministry of Sport of International Federations together. I guess the goal was to, uh, to evaluate was wor what worked well and what didn't work well and to get additional, <coughs> to get the financing for the next season. So I'm not sure if I should stop. I think it would be, I would, as I have very limited time, I would like to maybe focus on recommendations, which would be quite much more interesting. I'll be fast. So, as we discussed before, uh, about the role of uh, host country national federations in the games preparations, and about impact of the games, uh, from seeing the Vancouver and Sochi games experience, uh, these challenges were similar in both countries, and the recommendations would be similar to both countries. The challenge for National Federation is that they used to have a 100% control of their sport and having a co dynamic uh, driving them crazy for seven years is very challenging for them. So, and here are a few recommendations um, for that. So, be a partner and not adversary. So, national, if the National Federation that truly partnered with organizing committees significantly benefited in the long term, in the long term run. So there are many ways and a co can help national federations, if the nation, but if the national federation decides to be an adversary, then a co will focus on the other national federations that are more friendly to them. So the, as national federations' prime responsibility is to ensure they have the best possible teams and athletes, um, there are also, the federations are also there to help a co but they cannot lose the sight of their main task and team, national team is first. This brings me to the next point, where the success of the national team 
really affect the success of the games. You can have a great games, but if there is no domestic, if there are no domestic winners, then it will impact the game's success overall. So in the in the eyes of the domestic public. So not to pick on Canadians, um, but in, 90, in the Montreal Summer Games and Calgary Winter Games, Canada never won one single gold medal, and that had a huge impact on how Canadians viewed the games. This changed in Vancouver, uh, where the games were viewed as great success, in large part due to the success of the Canadian team. Um, that was the case in Russia, where our medal count had a huge impact on the public perception of the success of the games. This goes back to the successful partnership with national federations where um, it is a win-win if everybody works together. So for the national federation, it's, of, or it's often difficult to understand how OPOC actually works. Working inside of OPOC is extremely challenging since OPOC is big, bureaucratic, slow-moving organization which often frustrates the national federations. So for the National Federation, it's critical to make efforts to understand how OPOC functions in order to work together. So the National Federation should be the subject matter expert uh, within the host country nation and needs to provide necessary expertise when required. Going back to the partnership, um, this needs to be a two-way street uh, where the National Federation provides the expertise but also needs to be supported um, in their objectives. The biggest challenge we've seen is the National Federation does not start planning early enough in all areas. For the OCOC, it's critical that the NF have a good understanding of what they want out of the games from legacy perspective and uh, what they actually have and that they actually have the organizational capacity to help the games and to support OCOC and to train the athletes. So it all comes down to the partnership if National Federation is a good partner, they will benefit, so will the games. This is it. Sorry. No, thank you very much. Uh, we have time for a few quick questions to Isabella and Irina. Uh, my name is Carla from Brazil. Uh, my question is for three of you, okay? If you don't mind. Um, let me just put a, a, a panorama of Brazil. We have national federation, state ones and the national ones. We call them federation and co-federation, okay? Federation are the state ones and co-federation are the national ones, okay? So I'm using these two terms, federation and co-federation. Um, in Brazil, the last years, uh, it seems that leagues like the basketball leagues and volleyball leagues are becoming more important. And because of that, some federations, not the co-federation, but some federations are passing by uh, some issues. And some of them may be broken, they may be closed, and uh, it may not have uh, basketball in Rio de Janeiro, for instance because our federation is very, very uh, bad right now. Uh, we had some problems with the uh, volleyball confederation. It seems that the International Volleyball Federation had uh, somehow uh, also been attached by this problem. And uh, uh, what I want to know is, um, uh, 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 do you think especially you that come from Russia. Russia is similar from, from uh, Brazil. They are both Brits, they are both uh, uh, new economics, and of course there are differences between those two countries, but they are both big, big countries. Um, but in Brazil, uh, a recent uh, research has showed that 46% of our population do not practice any kind of sport and only 25.6 do sports, 25, a quarter of our population do sports. The other 28% do physical activity. That means what? That means that our federation, and our federation 
has some problems on getting new kids to practice sports. What's the question? And the question is, uh, sorry, Professor, can this big issue of uh, the leagues against federation and co-federation um, provide a negative impact in sports and inside the Olympic Games? Uh, I know that uh, uh, Agenda 21, uh, 2020 uh, talks about recommendation number eight uh, for, uh, about a relationship with professional leagues. That may be a path, but I want to know about Russia. Do you have the same problems that we have in Brazil with the leagues and the international federa uh, national federations? Can you can this? Uh, path of leads be uh, an active impact in sports and could be, uh, attach the Olympic Games in the future? I mean, I can say that in Russia, this is not the case in Russia, we have national federations which are members of international federation, that's how we work for them, but I was not really aware of leagues uh, regarding the Winter Olympic Games. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have Continental Hockey League, right? So, I mean, it, I mean, we our partner was National Federation, Ice Hockey Federation. So, this is who we're working with, and league was absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah we they want to go. Um, I'm not sure. This may be a very unique uh, problem for Brazil. Um, we certainly don't have this tension in the UK. Uh, sure. Maybe in the US. Uh, the, the reference to professional leagues and Agenda 2020 is specifically to the professional leagues in the United States of America, which is basketball, football, uh, ice hockey, and baseball. Uh, and it's how the Olympic movement will, will relate to that, to these four, because two or three of them are Olympic sports. So it's not an attractive, it's not particular to Russia, it's not particular to Brazil. And I'm pleased to say it wasn't. Thank you. Um, any other quick question? So we can move on to the next speaker. Um, yeah, hi, I have a question about Sochi. Um, with the emphasis in the presentation was on workforce, um, and London had an equality workforce strategy in who was recruited and recording sort of the different demographics that were working or volunteering within London. Um, did Sochi ever have a strategy to who they were upskilling and who was who, what the workforce was made up of? I mean, you're talking about support workforce, right? Yeah. So whether, so whether they were female or male, whether they were university I mean, educated we, or... No, I mean, we were welcoming everybody, but the, uh, statistics show that there were more females. We actually had challenges. We had more females than males at the end. And it was challenging not only for support, for across all other functions, right? So we... Um, we were recruiting sports-specific volunteers. And for us, most important was uh, uh, sports skills, right? So if they're able to ski, skate, or no, uh, no specific rules of a specific sport, and the language skills. So that was the main key, uh, actually, requirements we had for the sport volunteers. Whoever comes, comes. But national federations were able to provide us with some pool of volunteers they were using for, for their events. So we already got the package of volunteers uh, from national federations and we found own volunteers based on the requirements. That was actually quite a challenging project because some people overestimate their skills of skiing and skating, right? And uh, that led us to the multiple injuries during test events because people overestimate themselves. But this is, that's why we put serious training after the test events and serious selection to make sure the sport specific workforce is really sport. They don't support and they're able to deliver what is required. So this is how we select well, sport. It's a fascinating discussion. I'm sure we'll continue yeah. this over lunch, but we have to move on to the next speaker. Thank you both very much. Thank you.